Hey, give me a thumbs up. Oh, we're recording in progress. Okay, well, thanks for everybody for that's joining us tonight. And I have, uh, I can't uh, see the demographics of how many are in or how many are here, but uh, welcome. Um, I'm Dr. Travis Henry, and we'll uh, hopefully have some fun tonight talking about dentistry in horses. And uh, if there's questions, I believe that they can text in and we can try to cover some of those at the end. Um, but I want to- Yeah, just use the chat feature at the bottom and I will monitor that. And if they're about something you're just talking about, I'll interrupt you and ask. Otherwise that's, we'll uh, save them at the end. That's perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a practitioner of almost 30 years, went to Michigan State University back in the late eighties and finished up in the early nineties. Um, I've all done a residency dental training at UC Davis and worked out there for a number of years. And I'm board certified in veterinary dentistry, both small animal and in horses. So I, at our practice here, we see dogs, cats, and horses. Uh, a big predominance of our work is horses. And there's five doctors here. And we um, are a specialty clinic that only provides dental services. So that's just a little bit of a background on us. Um, and we'll jump right into it. And this is a presentation that's just going to hit a lot of highlights of things that can happen in your horse's mouth. And it's gonna explain kind of the process that we think about when we're performing a routine dental visit for your horse. And there's gonna be some other things that we discuss of the real horrific things that we can see, but um, it's not meant to scare you, but I will warn you that there are some pictures in here that are kind of graphic, but I think it's kind of good to see where um, how bad some of these dental conditions can get. So what is the importance of having a dental performed? And people talk all the time about, about getting my horse's teeth floated. And really there's, uh, that is a component of a dental visit, but there is a lot more to it than that. And so we ask this question, what's the importance? Is it just to have your horse's teeth floated to remove the sharp enamel points? Or is it to perform a complete exam with five components. And really the answer to that is all of the above, because if we forget about looking at, at all the structures of the head that are related to the teeth, we're not really doing that patient a service. Um, so when we look at how do we kind of go through that, we're just gonna kind of march our way through here. And um, some of the slides we'll spend a little more time on, some of them will take a little, will be um, shorter, but this is just a slide showing a dental chart of a horse. And to give you a little bit of a background about horses is that they can have a potential of 44 teeth. Um, and they're considered what's uh, a full mammalian dentition, meaning that they can have, uh, if we break them into quadrants. So if you look at this screen, um, can you see my arrow? Is that showing up as a pointer? Somebody can answer Yes, me? yes, okay. it is. Okay. So we, if we break them into quadrants, then there's four quadrants of teeth. And in each quadrant, a horse can have three incisors, one canine tooth, four premolars, and that includes the wolf tooth and three molars. And that, if you take four times that 11, that's 44. Now, if we have, there's some sexual dimorphism there in meaning that mares often won't have a fully developed canine tooth. And if your horse is in training and had dental care from when it was young, it probably has already had its wolf teeth removed. Um, and yes, horses can have wolf teeth on the mandibles as well. So they can, they don't always just have to, to be in the upper quadrants of the, of the dentition. So that gives us a potential for 44 teeth and multiple problems, which we'll discuss. But what we typically consider is appropriate is a good yearly exam on your horses with a full mouth speculum, sedation, and then the float happens after all of the previous things in the examination process. Because you really don't know what you need to do for floating unless you've done a complete exam. And so let's talk about how a horse kind of chews or the mechanics of their mouth. And realistically, horses don't chew just up and down like we, like we do or like dogs do or in cats or even more just up and down motion. They can't move their jaws much from side to side. Um, but a horse has a very three-dimensional chewing pattern. And what they're doing is they're moving food back into their mouth and the folds of their palate or the tissue on the roof of their mouth actually makes almost like an auger. So as they chew, 
and circle their jaw around to crush the food between their teeth, it actually augers it and pushes it back to the mouth till at the back of the mouth, it should be chewed up into a very fine particulate matter that then they can swallow mixed with lots of saliva. Horses also have a very interesting um, function with their nuchal ligament and their neck and the, um, all the ligaments that happen with the neck and the muscles is that when they reach to the ground to pick up food or nip off grass, their lower jaw actually slides forward a little bit and that allows them to nip. And when they pick their head up, the jaw moves back slightly and puts their molars in better occlusion and that allows them to chew. So if you watch a horse in the wild, they'll graze and they lift their head up, chew a lot of times with their heads up looking around, and then they go back down and graze some more and fill their mouth back up with food. And the reason for that is that there are prey animals. So they're picking their head up and looking around to make sure nothing's gonna come up and try to eat them. Our domestic horses don't have to worry about that, but they still have that function in their mandibles. And when we talk about putting bridles in them and putting them in certain headsets, we have to be aware of that because depending on how your horse carries its head and for you that do or perform dressage with your horse with the head in that more vertical position, that lower jaw needs to be able to slide and not make contact with the maxillary teeth. And because if it does, that's when we see the horses sometimes resist those headsets and resist being put in those positions because with a cavison on or anything else that's holding their mouth shut, that impedes that movement and sometimes they're resisting that. So we're always looking for malocclusions or teeth that have overlong areas that might be able to be caught and hooked as that mandible is trying to make that motion. So thorough yearly exam, what does that mean? This is an example of me a few years ago, a lot of years ago actually, but showing that I'm sitting down, I'm in a very comfortable position. We've got the horse's head pointed down because we're usually rinsing their mouth out with water to get all the food material out. And we don't want them to aspirate. So first things first is we want the horse in a comfortable position. We want their head pointed down. And then I've got a very bright headlight on and I'm shining that up into the horse's mouth. And then I'm making an assessment in this time of are there any malocclusions? What's the table angles? What are, how are the teeth positioned in this horse's head? And that's all done in a nice comfortable position for both the horse and for me. We use a dental mirror that's very similar to what you would see at your dentist. It's just giganto sized um, so that we can actually look up at each tooth. We have to use a mirror because my head won't fit in a horse's mouth. When you go to the dentist, they can look in your mouth because you can open it appropriately for them to see every tooth. Um, but they still use a mirror if they want to look behind a tooth or on the sides of your teeth or push your cheek out. And we use this mouth mirror in the horse in the very same way. The dental explorer is a little hooked instrument that we use that's very fine. And what we're checking for is any defects in the tooth that may cause the problems um, for endodontic disease where the inside of the tooth has become um, basically ill or is trying to not be vital. Every one of your horse's teeth is alive and has blood flow through it. It has nerves in it. It has lymphatic tissue in it. And those teeth are alive. And the, and the reason that it's so important that they're alive in your horse's head is that they're constantly rebuilding as they're wearing them away. Then there's the periodontal depth probe, and we're going to show a picture of all of this stuff here in a minute, but the periodontal depth probe is used to probe around the teeth, just like when you go to the dentist, because periodontal disease is one um, big disease process that affects up to 40% of the horses in population when they're between zero and 15 years of life, and over 15 years, it can be as high as 70%. So we really want to be looking at the periodontal health of your horse because that's a condition that can lead to tooth loss. Reasons to look. So here's an, actually a dental mirror in a horse's mouth and you can see that the tongue is being retracted away from the tooth that we're looking at and you can see the food that's stuck between these two teeth. That's the beginning of periodontal disease and I always make the kind of funny joke that horses can't floss their teeth because we haven't figured out a way for them to hold on to the floss with their hooves. Um, and, you know, that's kind of funny, but realistically, horses' teeth are supposed to be so tightly packed together that no food should be sticking between them. And if you look at the rest of the teeth in this picture, it's so tight, it's hard to sometimes tell what's one tooth versus what's the next tooth. And that's that tight 
interproximal space or the difference between this tooth and this tooth is there, there is just not even a millimeter gap hardly in there at all. And that's so that they don't have to floss their teeth basically. It's functioning as one giant tooth in their mouth. So here's just a skull. And to show you guys kind of how the teeth are all positioned in the horse's skull, this green arrow to the far right is the incisors. Um, and this is the maxillary incisors. And you can see how these interdigitate. And you can see that little gap between the front of the maxillary incisors and the mandibular incisors. And some people would say, well, this horse has a little bit of an overbite. That's not true. This horse, that's, this is just a skull without the neck on it. So when this horse would bend to the ground <clears throat> to nip grass, these incisors would actually push forward and line up so that it could nip the grass appropriately. And then when it picks up its head, it's gonna slide back into this position to align all of these cheek teeth. And you can see that there's a big battery of teeth here. There's six in this row and six in this row, and they're masticating against each other to grind up the food. This little curved arrow is the wolf tooth and these are the canine teeth. So this would be a, a male horse. Tooth anatomy, in the horse it's actually quite complex compared to other species. The, the horse ends up having um, in the cheek teeth and the chewing teeth on the right hand side of the screen, there are multiple what we call pulp horns or endodontic chambers. And that's what the yellow arrow is pointing to as one of them. So in <clears throat> this, Example, there's one here, 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 and here. And what this tooth is really made up of is the same materials that make up your tooth. There's cementum, which is on the outside edge of the tooth. And that's what actually holds the tooth into the bony socket of the horse's head. And then the material is very porous. Above the gum line, it's actually alive and rebuilding itself. And this is where the periodontal ligament or the soft tissue embeds into that. And on the other side would be the bone. So if you want to think about it in simplistic terms, the periodontal ligament is like Velcro with its fibers going into the bone and its other fibers going into this substance that is wrapping around this tooth. <clears throat> then all this bright white material is enamel, very hard like glass. It folds around all over in this tooth and it makes it like a rasp basically. And that's the corrugated surface that gives us the grinding ability on these animals' teeth. In the middle of the maxillary tooth is an infundibular structure, which is like a funnel of enamel filled with cementum. And that actually provides bigger space for this tooth because the lower teeth are gonna be the ones scrubbing away at this tooth to grind up the food. In these pulp horns or these structures here, it's lined by dentin. You would know it as ivory. And it's a material that's constantly being laid down by the live tissue that's in that tooth. So that as your horse's tooth is worn away with chewing, it rebuilds and continues to try to maintain about a centimeter deep layer of that on this, in these teeth so that your horse never ends up with a sensitive tooth or an exposure of those nerves. So that means that every time your horse is eating, it's wearing away a bit of this tooth. One of the fallacies out there is that horses are continually making tooth. They're not. At five years old, your horse has all the tooth it's gonna have. And as it ages, it wears that tooth away and continues to push it into the mouth or erupt it into the mouth. But when that tooth is gone, it's gone. And that brings up an interesting fact too, is that that's why we don't want to be over floating horses or over rasping their teeth because we want to preserve all that we can. So the, the bottom line is, is when a horse reaches an average age of about 25, that's the life expectancy of, their, of the teeth in their mouth. Now there's horses that live to be 30 some years old and still have functional teeth, but there are also horses that are younger than 25 that are starting to have a very worn out mouth. And a lot of that depends on what they're eating and what and where in the country they live um, and what type of soil conditions they're eating off of. If it's a very sandy, rough soil or they're eating very fibrous feeds, we'll see definitely an increase in wear um, concerning age compared to our horses, say, here in the Midwest. So I work out of Arizona quite a bit. And when I'm down there, I definitely see horses that are younger with more worn out mouths than I do here in the Midwest. On the left is a picture of an incisor, and 
they have one of those pulp chambers, which is this brown kind of comma shaped structure. And then they have one infundibula in them, which is this funnel shaped um, structure in the middle. And then they are wrapped with enamel. And in the middle of this whole area is all ivory. So this gives the tooth a little bit more grinding ability and to snip off grasses. So there's a lot heavier layer of enamel around the, the lip edge of these teeth or the, the area of the tooth is called the labial area where the lip touches. This area is thicker enamel for that ability to be worn against as it's biting grass off. Sinusitis is something that we see very um, closely associated with our teeth. And this is a miniature horse where we're actually removing pus from the sinus from an infected tooth. And the reason that that got started was one of these pulp horns on that pony's teeth had become exposed because the tooth died. It wasn't able to lay down more ivory in that chamber and that made a solid tube that ran all the way up through the tooth. So as the horse ate, it packed food all the way through the tooth which ended up coming out through the root and into the sinus compartment. Because if we back up to this region of this and look at this skull again, the teeth from here to the back of this horse's mouth is all sitting in a huge sinus compartment up here. There's actually five sinuses on each side of the horse or six, depending on how you name them and where you went to school. But this is a big, in a, in a good size horse, like a warm blood, this could be a quart volume on each side of the horse's head that can get filled full of pus from an infected tooth. So when we're doing that exam that we're talking about, and we'll show pictures of it here in a minute, um, we're looking at these structures on the ends of the tooth every time that horse's mouth is opened with a mirror to make sure that there's not one of these pulp horns that's becoming exposed so that food could get into it. And this is just an Example, on a mandibular tooth or a lower tooth, you can see that little probe right here that I'm sticking in and I'm able to sink that probe into the tooth there. That tooth has a dead structure in this region right here. So at this point, I'm going to recommend radiographs to examine that tooth below the gum line because there's could be as much as three inches of tooth that I cannot see because it's buried in the bone. And we want to look and see is that becoming infected? Has the horse maybe built a bridge of the ivory across that structure to protect it from getting food all the way to the root? Or is the root actually infected and we need to do something like a root canal or an extraction? Horses sometimes are blessed with problems that they didn't read the blueprint that they were supposed to have when they got built. This is a radiograph and it's the first horse that I actually ran into this. It's a very poor radiograph, so I apologize. It was plain film, but it's just a cool example that I keep around to remember 25 years ago. But horses, we said they're supposed to have six teeth and you can see I've numbered them here for you. There's seven there. And what that's caused is a supernumerary tooth or an extra tooth at the very back of the mouth. So if we look down here, the bottom of the screen, there's nothing for this tooth to grind against but jawbone and tissue. So as this tooth erupts out, it's hitting the jaw. And in this particular horse, a couple of things were happening is food was getting up in between this tooth because when he would chew, the tooth here would push this one back and open a space. And that packed food all the way up to the top and then created a sinusitis. So this horse actually got presented to us for a snotty nose, which was food material and pus coming out of their nose because it was going up through this space into the sinus and then out the nasal passage. The other thing it was doing was he had a big old sore here because he could barely get his mouth shut because his this tooth was trying to occlude or rub on this jawbone right here. So the treatment for this was to extract this tooth. And unfortunately, it had gone on so long without being noticed that this tooth was also failing as well. So this horse had to end up having two of teeth removed. And so then we have the problem with the tooth below is going to try to come up without having something to grind against. So every six months, this horse had to have this tooth rasped down or floated down to keep it from coming up too high in his mouth as well. So everything in dentistry has a yin and a yang. So if we extract a tooth, the tooth that's opposing is trying to get too long and we've got to continue to float it. Um, or 
they'll form malocclusions where there's a missing tooth, the teeth actually try to drift together and close that gap. And so we can end up with teeth being too long on the ends of the quadrant as well. So extraction fixes the main problem of infection, but it creates a malocclusion that we have to continue to address for the rest of the horse's life. Oops, I jumped ahead. This is an example of the anatomy of this horse's head um, not being lined up exactly perfect either. And the, and the problem here is that the lower jaw is sitting too far back. So this is a horse with what we call a class two malocclusion and that the lower jaw stops its um, ability to masticate right here. And that's allowing these big long daggers to form off the front of this horse's uh, first premolars. Now, if you put in a bridle in here, this is all gonna get trapped up with the bit and can cause irritation to the horse on the sides of the cheek. And actually I was quite impressed. I remember this horse that it didn't have bigger sores in its cheeks because a lot of them will get those. But also remember that the lower jaw is not that far away when the mouth is closed, that they can rub and cause problems with the lower jaw as well. These are just a couple of pictures of examples of wolf teeth. And you can see the little premolar sitting out ahead of the first, um, pre the second premolar. So here's a wolf tooth on the left of the screen where my arrow is at and the one on the right. The one on the left is actually a young horse. I can tell you it's a two-year-old because this is a deciduous tooth getting ready to be exfoliated and come off. And the tooth, the permanent tooth is emerging through the gum line here. So this is a young horse and just an example of a cap, a permanent tooth and a wolf tooth. This poor horse, something went drastically wrong in the development of his mouth because these teeth did not get in that nice tidy line that we talked about in being one battery of tooth. So this poor horse has got raging periodontal disease between several teeth. And that's because <clears throat> when this horse chews, it's able to pack food between several of these teeth. Now I've cleaned it all out for the purposes of this picture but you can see the red bloody areas where food was packed down in between these teeth. So I guess you could uh, call one of my mentors years and years ago called these summer teeth. Some are here and some are there. <laughs> so equine dentistry kind of in, in my mind has many different facets to it or classifications. There's your young horse that's has its deciduous teeth when it's born. So a, a young horse gets his cheek teeth during the last um, months of gestation. So when they're born, they've got teeth that can chew hay generally. They get their incisors, it's, they get their first set of incisors in the middle at six to seven days. They get the second incisors at six to seven weeks and they get their third incisors at about six to seven months. Then they erupt in a molar at one year old, a molar at two years old, then they start losing their deciduous or baby cheek teeth at two years, eight months, two years, 10 months, and three years, eight months. And then they get their last molar somewhere between three and a half and four. So by running through that, you can see that the young juvenile horses always are getting or erupting in teeth and losing teeth until they're about five years old. So there's a whole lot of business going on in the young horse. And oftentimes that's where our problems get started. So we tend to like to see horses in their juvenile stages so that we're not missing something that could be developing that comes around to bite us when they're eight to 10 years old. And then there's the training horse. So we just said that these horses are getting and losing a bunch of teeth up until five years old. Now we wanna start training them, riding them, putting bridles in them when they're two, three years old, maybe four. But we have to remember that sometimes these mouths aren't that comfortable and that's because they're cutting teeth um, and they're also getting very sharp because their deciduous teeth are very soft and they'll make very sharp points and so it's important to have any horse that is going into training have their mouth looked at not only just for the health of the mouth and how does it occlude and how does it match up um, with the mandible versus the maxilla um, for those malocclusion things that we were talking about, but also just how healthy is this mouth? Because we can see periodontal disease sometimes in the horses as young as a year old. Then there's the middle-aged horse. That's the horse that has all of its adult teeth. Everything should be puttering along very nicely, but we also can't forget that if they're not lined up exactly right, or there's a slight gap between two teeth or a malocclusion where 
maybe they're missing a tooth or something's happened when they were a young horse, then we need to be continually working on those horses to make sure that something that is minor that we can just address yearly with a good float and a good exam doesn't end up becoming a big problem that causes the horse to need an extraction or some type of surgery when they're older. The other thing to say about juveniles and training horses is that's the time when we see traumas. We see teeth being pulled out um, with them biting on something, getting their, you know, they're always playing and doing something a little bit crazy. And we see a lot of the fractured jaws and um, fractured teeth and all sorts of things um, in that age as well. Generally, when we get to the middle-aged horse, it's pretty, it's fairly rare to see jaw fractures and them pulling teeth loose because they've gotten a little bit wiser and smarter, hopefully, as they've gotten older. And then um, the geriatric horse is the horse that is very um, highly at risk for periodontal disease. And they're having their teeth are starting to wear out. Um, and we need to be looking for advanced periodontal disease that maybe has gone unaddressed throughout its life. And now it's got a loose tooth or um, it's got a big gap in between teeth that food is impacting. Um, that's where we see a lot of our sinus infections from is in the older horse. Plus those are the horses that are starting to have problems with Cushing's syndrome and their immune system is not firing on all eight cylinders at that point and they're having um, a lack or, or their immune system is becoming subpar and some of the infections that happen in the mouth with periodontal disease can run amok because their immune system is unable to fight it off then. So we definitely see a higher propensity of um, older horses with periodontal disease. And then the kind of the elephant in the room for veterinarians when we talk about horses and teeth is purchase exams because people will are buying a horse not because you're buying a horse that has pretty teeth you're buying a horse because you want it to be sound and you want it to be healthy and oftentimes the purchase exam process is focused on the skeletal components of the horse how straight is its legs is it sound how what do the feet look like is it trotting off sound after flexion exams and we take dozens of sets of x-rays of these horses to confirm that they don't have arthritis and everything else. But I would, I would also push that we should be looking at their mouths closely because I've had several horses in my career come to me as short as weeks after a purchase exam and find a major problem. And actually that horse that I showed you with the seven teeth, that's how I ended up meeting that horse was six weeks after a purchase exam. And the horse was noted to have a bit of a nasal discharge at the time that was thought to be allergies. And it was really stemming from the fact that he had seven teeth in his head and his mouth was never examined when he had a purchase exam done. So just a little plug in there that when you're buying horses, don't forget that they have teeth and that they have, they need that ability to eat well and perform for you because you're putting a bridle in that mouth. All right, so we're going to talk about equipment a little bit and what we do in this exam. We're going to show some examples of problems in the oral exam, and then we'll do a little bit more review of some anatomy. Um, the picture just shows uh, a tooth with decay. And in this day and age now, there are some things we can do for restorations. And so that's actually a human uh, filling composite that we've used to restore that tooth so that we could hopefully stop the decay process and avoid having to extract the tooth for the horse. Okay, so looking back, and this is what a horse's mouth looks like when you open it up and shine a bright light in it. And it's just a big long tunnel. On the top is those folds in that palate that I said act as that auger to kind of push food back as they're chewing. When I look in this horse's mouth, I'm very concerned. And I'm very concerned because one side is stained badly and the other side is not. So people always ask, you know, I, when I worked in California, people would ask, actually asked me if I could whiten their horse's teeth. And the answer to that is no. You do not have in your mouth cementum that covers the labial surface of your teeth. So you're seeing pearly white enamel. Horses have that yellow material because their teeth are continuously erupting and pushing out of the gum line and that cementum carries along with the tooth. So what we're seeing here with the arrow would have been below the gum line four or five years ago. So this cementum turns yellowish and picks up stain. You can see it over here, the brown. The reason this side of this horse's mouth is very stained is that this horse is avoiding chewing on this side. And the food material that your horse eats has tannins in it. Just like when you drink a lot of coffee, your teeth are gonna stain brown and that's because coffee has tannins in it. 
So when the horse is not chewing on this side, the tannin staining builds up. On the other side, the horse is chewing over here and it's scrubbing these teeth against each other the entire time it's chewing and that keeps it this yellow color. So this is one of the highlights that we look at and we teach residents and student veterinarians that are coming in to work with us is that when you see a tooth, a tooth or a number of teeth that are stained brown compared to say the opposite side of the horse's mouth, that's where you need to focus your attention because this horse is avoiding chewing on that side, allowing the stain to pick up. But we always get the question of why did my horse's teeth brown? And that's the reason. Now, when you feed them hay, they're less brown. When they eat green grass, it has a higher tannin load, they'll be more brown. So when you look at a horse's mouth in the summer, even their tissues will be stained brown often. But in the winter, that'll look like this. All right, so we're gonna march on here. The dental mirror. I cannot stick my head in a horse's mouth, like I said earlier, to look to the side to see that there's a gap in between these two teeth. And you can actually see that there's some recession or the gum line is kind of dropping. And that's because when we opened this horse's mouth and first went in with a mirror, this would be all packed full of food. <clears throat> and the food then rots and it releases acids and becomes a lower pH in this localized environment. And that creates inflammation. Once we put inflammation here, the tissues and the bone don't like it. And we start to set up a whole new environment for bacteria that normally shouldn't be living there and that causes the start of periodontal disease. In this horse then to correct this, we would have just clipped off a little bit of this tooth and this tooth to make a bigger space, which sounds counterintuitive. Well, isn't Dr. Henry more food gonna pack in there? But it doesn't because it can cycle through. So just floating this horse's teeth, yes, that'll help, but until we make these walls of this more parallel so the food will slide through, then the food is not gonna get entrapped. Plus, these teeth are gonna to migrate together over time because of the eruption pattern that the teeth um, undergo and also the angulation that they're leaving the, the jaw. So if I can make this a flat surface here and here, and as they abut someday again, it, albeit it'll be several years, they should mate back up in a straight line and then we won't have food impaction anymore. So that's just a little rundown on a diastema which means an improper space between teeth. So this is just a close up of the instruments that we use. They're very fine. Um, that's partly why we have to have the horse sedated because no horse is gonna like you to go in here with their tongue moving all over and tossing their head around and have you poking with them. You're gonna end up poking at their tongue or their cheek or their tissues around the teeth. And they're not gonna like that. We should be able to do this sedated very carefully and only place this probe to check the depth around an individual tooth. This is a scaler to remove calculus. Yes, horses get calculus in certain areas, just like dogs and cats do. And then this is that little surface probe that we use on the surface of the tooth. So here's a tooth that had a big blob of calculus on it. And when we remove that, we could see a tract on the side of the tooth. And when we placed the probe up there, it went up there 50 millimeters, so about two inches. So this tooth, has abscessed at some point in the horse's life. And now the abscess was just draining back into the mouth. But radiographically, that tooth was dead and had a, the horse had a swelling on the side of its face and that tooth ended up having to be extracted. But with the mirror, I can see up the side of the horse's tooth and with the probe, I can carefully go in there. Horses don't like you putting the, your hands in their mouth, even sedated, they're gonna try to spit your hand out. So we try to use things that are small and long so that we can access the mouth and, and do this examination process without stimulating their soft tissues so that they're trying to continuously spit us out of their mouth. This is an example of a dead tooth um, with an exposed pulp horn on a mandibular tooth. And you can see where that probe is sinking into the tooth. So that's what we use to, to assess the endodontic health of this tooth. So the exam process that we use, we break it down into five components. And the reason that we do that is that we do a complete exam every time and we look at all the structures associated with the teeth. And the first thing that we look at is the outside of the head. Then we'll look at the occlusion or how the teeth made up to each other. Then the tissues that are in the mouth, the periodontal health, which is really 
the periodontal structures are the structures that are holding the tooth in the jaw. Without your periodontia, your teeth are gonna fall out. And there's really four, four um, components to the periodontia. There's the cementum of that tooth. There's the alveolar bone. There's that periodontal ligament that we talked about, like the Velcro. And then there's the gingiva, which is that really tough tissue that surrounds everybody's tooth <clears throat> that acts like a gasket to keep food from impacting down between the tooth and the bone. And then there's the endodontic status, which just means all of the structures and the live tissues that live inside of the tooth. So external exam, what are the things that we're looking for there? Well, horses have a, a vast amount of musculature to do this grinding process. Mainly they're <clears throat> the muscles of the tongue, the muscles of um, the masseter on the outside of the face here, and then the temporalis muscle underneath the forelock. And if we notice atrophy or loss of that muscle in one of those regions, I'm concerned that the horse is either not chewing with that certain side, or there may be some type of neurologic problem that the nerves aren't able to fire that muscle anymore. And we see that with conditions such as EPM or trauma to the head and the neck. We're gonna look for swellings, like this horse has a big old swelling on his jaw here, and that was from a tooth abscess. <clears throat> And they can be soft or they can be bony. And they can be as hard as a rock or they can be very soft and fluctuant and painful to the horse. So generally our long-standing um, tooth infections can be very bony and hard where our very hot, acute, um, recent to come into the horse's pro problem list are gonna be soft and painful. If this goes on for a long period of time, then a lot of times it will bust out and drain due to gravity and we'll have a draining tract that leaves the jaw. Um, we just had one in today that we had to perform an extraction on that had like a softball on the side of its head right here that was draining pus out of his face. And that was all from an infected tooth. And then we also like to smell both nostrils and look for any drainage from the nasal passages because we, as we spoke earlier, that horses have three and a half basically teeth of on both sides that sit inside their sinus compartments. So here's just another example of a tooth infection with a bony swelling on the side of the face that's fairly acute. This horse didn't like this touched and uh, it had popped up over about a week's period of time. A lot of people put these on antibiotics and think, oh, it, it went down and it looks fine. And then you take them off antibiotics and it gets bigger again. And then it goes down with more antibiotics, but. I'll, I will honestly tell you in all my 30 years, I've never seen antibiotics fix a tooth infection because if that tooth is dead and it can't rebuild itself, at some point it's gonna be wear, worn through enough to fill full of food and you'll end up with a big old draining tract out the side of their face. So generally at this stage in the game with this bony swelling on the horse's head, radiographs are required so that we can look at the health of that tooth now, it doesn't mean that every bony swelling on a horse's head has to have a tooth extraction. I'm just saying that if a tooth is involved and we can see radiographic evidence that the infection is, a, is causing death to that tooth with a large lucent pattern of the bone, you're better off to have it extracted early because as time goes on, the tooth will end up getting internal decay and falling apart and the extraction process becomes a lot larger nightmare than what it is from the start. Dr. Henry, you've got about yeah. not quite 15 minutes left. Okay. I don't know where you are in your sure. presentation. We but. can move along here. Yep. There's just more examples of external things. These are some very large malocclusions that we can see. Um, this horse had had a tooth extracted and we have a very overlong blade here. So this horse lacks the ability to grind this away. This is the importance of floating is to reduce these. This is bit trapping, and for you guys performing dressage, this is a horse we had in this week that was actually trapping the bit and carving a big hole in his tooth. And that's an improper bit placement and size of bit in this horse that created that. So this was before we started the process of floating and after. This is just incisor occlusion. This horse's mouth, is, it does not line up correctly. So these should be over here and these should be farther this way but this will cause impedance of the horse to be able to chew over time. This is your parrot mouth horse. You can see these in your warm bloods. You won't see this probably. This is more draft horses and miniature horses. 
And this is just a float in the mouth. We like to use water cooling as we're moving the sharp points. This is a circular disc. And the reason that we like these type of instruments is we can be very precise. Hand floats are great. I used to float a lot of horses by hand, but you are floating many teeth at one time when you're scrubbing back and forth. But with an instrument like this, we can be very precise on just one area of a tooth so that we're not affecting the teeth on each side. These are some examples of horses that had trauma to their head and have very steep table angles. Normally they have an angle like this, but these horses were unable to actually chew on this side. And as the teeth continued to erupt, they got a very steep table angle to them. Now this is something that we can maintenance, but we're not going to fix. We'll talk about the soft tissues for a little bit. So this is tongue lacerations. This horse actually was picking up glass in an old barnyard when it was eating and it would tip over its grain pan and it was causing these large abrasions in the tongue and in um, cuts. But this horse would also drool when it would eat. So it had a very painful tongue. So sometimes environment can play a role in their soft tissues as well and what they're getting themselves into. These are your classic abrasions in this picture from the sharp points that happen on the side of the horse's teeth. So you can see that we've spent 40 minutes talking about horses dentition and I still have yet to talk about the sharp points that they get. Now these are important from your performance and their, their comfort when they're performing and chewing, but this is normal for a horse. If they're gonna be chewing forage and having that side to side grinding motion, they're going to form these points. That's a normal process. If I come back and look at a horse a year later and there's no points at all formed in the horse's mouth, I'm concerned that whatever happened in his mouth a year ago when he was floated may have been too much because realistically, this is a normal process that happens. You can see at the red arrow, there's a large hole in the palate here forming from this big ramped hook on the lower tooth. And this is just a horse that hasn't had his teeth floated in probably three or four years where this is formed, or maybe even five years. And that's because his lower jaw in this horse's case sits too far forward of the maxillary teeth. And that's causing this large point. And every time he chews, he's catching his palate with that big hook. And so to help this horse eat better, we just shave this down so it wasn't contacting his palate anymore. These are some of the injuries we can see with sharp areas of the rostral mouth in your bridle because your bridle can help pull this into the sharp areas along the teeth. Now we've already floated this horse, so they're all gone. This horse had some very large points associated with the maxillary teeth. And in performance, he was trapping that tissue up against them in the bit and creating these bitting sores. <clears throat> this is a horse with a, a large ulcer in the back of the mouth. And we never really proved what caused this, but this horse would drool and we had to put it on some medications that helped put a Band-Aid over that. But these are ulcers that we're looking for um, that is very, un these are unlikely in the horse, but this is one of the things that you can see with soft tissue um, trauma in the mouth. Here's a stick stuck across um, a horse's mouth. This causes a lot of drooling in them. Um, this is usually a lot of horses that can get out into areas that have forestry and things where they're chewing on wood and trees. Um, so that's always a concern if your horse is uh, chewing on a lot of wooden things. This is a tumor in a mouth. So this horse wasn't eating well and it was drooling. We were called out to see if it needed a tooth float or a dental float. And this was a big fibrosarcoma tumor um, in this horse's mouth. Periodontal things. These are diastomas, like I said, inappropriate spaces between teeth where food can impact. This is very painful for these horses. It's like having roast beef stuck between your teeth for weeks. And every time they eat, they pack more food in there and their mouth is just very painful in these areas. And this can cause performance problems as well because your horse's mouth is uncomfortable. These are just more examples of those. When they get very deep like this one on the left, generally at this point, we're having root exposure. And at this stage in the game, even though this tooth isn't loose, it's best to be extracted so that we don't end up with a sinusitis or a, or a deeper infection into the jaw or the head of the horse. Just more examples of periodontal things. And this is where you really need, the person doing the dental procedure for you really should be using a mirror because it's very easy to miss these without putting a mirror in the horse's mouth. 
This is just showing the periodontal probe again. Gingival recession incisors. For those of you that have horses that are older than 15, you really, if your horse starts to look like this, you need to have radiographs performed. And basically if your horse is over 15, the research shows us that they really deserve to have x-rays of their incisors. Especially if you're noticing little pimples like this around your horse's incisors, because it can turn into this type of condition, which is the equine odontoclastic tooth resorption and hypersemantosis, which is EOTRH. And this poor horse couldn't get his lips shut to actually pick up food anymore and was starting to lose a bunch of weight. And the treatment for it at this stage is extraction of all of these teeth. This is just an example of showing a horse that looks like it's got pretty normal incisors, but this horse had stopped grazing, was starting to lose some weight, and also did not like to take the bridle anymore. This is the radiographs of this horse. And you can see where there's destruction of several of these teeth and widening of the periodontal ligament around this horse. And the correction for this horse's condition was to remove all of its incisors. And once we did that, he went right back to eating. So there's this horse eating the next morning. And the lady told me she wasn't going to come to the hospital and pick him up until I proved her that he would eat hay. And uh, as you can see, this horse is shoveling up hay like there was no tomorrow. A little bit on endodontic status then and why it's important to check the surface of each tooth with the mirror. As you can see, I'm ramming an inch and a half needle up into that horse's tooth because that tooth is dead. And what that means is that there's food packing in there and rotting and that tooth is gonna to continue to decay until it starts to fracture and fall apart. And so it's important to look at each tooth individually and the surface of them very carefully with that mirror because this horse was starting to have bridling issues and chewing funny and the horse has a really nice mouth otherwise, but this tooth had two dead chambers in it. And we, end, we actually ended up doing a root canal on this area of this tooth here. And he went on to keep that tooth for 10 years. We followed that horse. So just a little review again of the tooth anatomy, but just showing you here the use of the chamber and how we're sticking it into that abnormal tooth. And that is always kind of, I know it's kind of gross that we're sticking a probe up into this horse's tooth, but that's how we examine and find dead teeth. This horse has been floated well but was having a swelling on his face and chewing funny. And when we went out to examine it, we found that that tooth was dead and inflamed and causing the horse pain. Because here's that tooth sectioned in half. And what I'm showing you is all the internal components here. These are those pulp horns full of ivory that we talked about. But this one is exposed and it's full of food all the way up through here and exiting the root. So you can see how that travels all the way up through the tooth and can cause an abscess at the top of the tooth. And this is what happens if it goes on to decay further and further is that these chambers widen out due to the decay process. And then this tooth becomes weak and starts to fracture off pieces. And a lot of times that's when you start to notice the horse really eating um, poorly because these pieces can get stuck in their cheek or their tongue. Uh, but horses don't chew on rocks and break their teeth. They break their teeth because the tooth is diseased and has decay in it and it's not as strong as it should be. And as they're just performing their own chewing functions on that tooth, they bust off pieces. Here's a tooth just showing these chambers cleaned out and how there's holes in every one of this um, poor tooth's endodontic system. And there's a close-up of food impacted into a tooth. Root canal treatment, sometimes we can save them. This is a root canal on an incisor tooth. And there's just a close-up uh, two years later showing that the bone is all nice and healthy again. And this horse ended up living to be 22 years old with that root canal in that tooth. They can have defects in their teeth from birth when this tooth formed that leaves a voided hole in the middle of the tooth and food can impact. And we can see the grayness to this tooth and decay starting to happen. And in these teeth, we'll often recommend that we do a restoration process to try to save that so that that decay process doesn't start getting larger. And you can see here where we're gonna pick how much food can actually get up in that tooth. And this is called an infundibular caries. So what do we do when we find all of these things? We better write them down. 
and keep good records because each year when we go back to look at these teeth, we want to have marked out on some type of, we use mostly electronic things now, but this is the, um, in, in the hospital, we still use these paper charts where we can draw on them and each, each tooth here you can see has those five chambers so we can circle and mark which one they are. And each We've of got them about a nice. minute or two left. I just want okay. to make sure that- um, well, I thought we started a, a little bit. Okay. Well, I thought we started at five after, so I'm- Oh, okay, you're right, you're right. And then on the back of the chart is all of our treatments that we've done. But in you know, all cases, when we find endodontic disease or um, periodontal disease, we're gonna recommend radiographs. So this is a two-year-old, and I just wanted to give you guys kind of an idea of how much of their jaw is actually taken up by teeth. So there's the first three premolars. This horse has periodontal disease at a, as a two-year-old. It's already causing bony changes to it surrounding this teeth. If you look at this tooth, how nice and tight the bone is all the way around it. In this tooth, we can see that there's a lucent pattern here. Well, that's actually inflammation starting to happen around this tooth as well. So this tooth is already starting to become in trouble due to the food impaction that's happening between these two teeth. And then just kind of what I think is cool is this is a developing tooth in the back. There's a third molar that's going to end up being this size where my marker is when this horse is four years old. So just to give you an idea of how much of their lower jaw is taken up by teeth when they're a young animal. So physical exam, we want to make sure the horse is healthy for this. An oral exam, provide the right diagnostics. And then lastly is to perform that float process. So hopefully this gives you a little insight to what a real, a really good dental exam should be for your horses and not just jump in there with a set of floats and take the sharp points off because there's a whole lot more that can be going on inside your horse's mouth that can lead to problems with chewing can lead to problems with performance and their overall health. And that's all I got for you. <laughs> um the things people are starting to drop off, but they're saying really fascinating things. Want to thank Dr. Henry, wonderful presentation. Um, a great presentation, very helpful. So uh, I don't there, I don't see any questions. If you do, you can unmute yourself and ask, or you can type them in the chat. Um, I, the, the question that I thought of people might have was when you were talking about EOTRH. Yes. That, <laughs> The big buzzword of the year. Um, <laughs> you, you, yeah, you said that, um, you know, the only treatment we have right now is extraction. Can you say anything about prevention? So there's a, the problem with EOTRH is that, and we've been involved in actually the largest study that was done in America with this practice and published on it and in several other things that are going on with EOTRH or around the world, honestly. Um, one of my residents from Australia just published a big retrospective study looking at it that should be coming out soon. We don't know what's truly causing this. Um, we have some very interesting theories and I can tell you my opinion, this isn't gospel, but I think that a lot of this is caused from husbandry in that we're taking a horse that was designed to graze 18 hours a day in the wild and we've put them in a stall to eat hay a few hours a day in grain sources because what we've what we before COVID we went out to the Indian reservations and we were taking X-rays of horses that were living wild, and in our domestic population we found that up to um, over 50% of the horses when they turned in that 15 to 18 year old range already had lesions. And when we looked at the wild horse population and the very cursory 35 horses that we got to x-ray out there before COVID, we found that the percentage was down in the mid twenties. So, and that's because when we look at our horses, like this horse is a, is a 19 year old horse and his tooth length is similar to when he was 12 and 14 years old. So they're not wearing their incisor away because they're not needed. You know what I'm, do you follow me? They're not, they're not using them to nip off grass 18 hours a day and shortening them on a normal yeah. process. And when we looked at the wild kept horses, they were little short teeth when they hit their twenties. Mm -hmm. And so those teeth are continually to, continuing to erupt the entire time. So that changes the, where their position is in their mandible and their maxilla and is shifting them forward. And that's why we see what's called these big Stillman's clefts or 
recession of the tissue along here, which gives more surface area for bacteria and things to adhere to. And then at some point we start to get some micro movement of those teeth because they've lost that attachment on the labial sides. And that starts the inflammatory process. Once the cells called odonoclasts get turned on, they're eating away at the tooth and also the, the osteoclasts get turned on and that's where we start to see these big lucent patterns. One of the facets that happens is a reparative process where they get cementum that builds up around the tooth like I showed here. And that's a reparative process that tries to stabilize that tooth in what's left of the alveolus so that it's not having that motion. Um, but not all of them do this. So in the one study that we were involved in, we looked at 170 horses that were presented for floating. If they had a problem with their incisors or a known problem with their incisors, they were excluded. And then we took radiographs of every one of those. So those were truly horses in a population that weren't thought to have an incisor problem. Mm -hmm. And we found that over 50% of them had an EOTRH lesion without noticing it. And that was eye-opening for us because I didn't think that there would be that kind of percentage out there. Um, but that leads us to the fact that that's why we say from that research, and there's been two other studies in Europe that have been, or one big study in Europe that was about the same number that we did that had, they didn't know we were doing our study and we didn't know they were doing theirs. And we came up with almost this, actually they found a little higher percentage. Mm -hmm. um, but what it proved was without radiograph, you don't know what's happening. Yeah. until it's really bad. Good point. Good point. Any other last questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so I have had many vets and equine dentists come to my barn. A lot of the times, I the things that you talked about in the exam, I will say that some of the vets that have come don't really do all of the things that you mentioned. Do you recommend that we go to um, an equine dentist specialist? on a regular basis versus well, the, the only pet. people that the only people that are legally allowed to call themselves equine dental specialists have to have board certification training in dentistry and right. that requires right. that requires a residency so yeah. for instance at this practice we're a residency training site for people to come but it's a grueling process it's three years it's a huge test they have to perform all these different kinds of procedures but if you truly want a specialist to look at your horse's teeth and that are gonna do this kind of exam, you either need to find a veterinarian that is interested in dentistry and has all of this instrumentation, or you have to find somebody that's done a residency and board certification training in it. It's like- well, I, and It I, seems I, like we have very few people. <laughs> I mean, <yeah. laughs> there's a lack of people that have this specialty. Well, and that's, I mean, and unfortunately, you know, in the early 1900s, the veterinary schools basically said horse dentistry is for the lay people and the farriers to do. And that started a lay camp of people doing teeth. Mm -hmm. um, and then we fast forward a hundred years and now we've realized that we were missing the boat. And the other compounding problem to all of this as well is that we have, when I graduated 30 years ago, an old horse was 20. Right. I mean, I remember getting called out to farms to vaccinate the whole barn and I would say, hey, what about that one out there? Oh, he's 20. We're not doing anything with him anymore. Like, we're not spending <laughs> any money. Well, but now there are people riding and performing. I mean, you guys know this. I mean, they're they're doing yeah. great a lot because we've extended their lifespan, but we've kind of forgot about their teeth. <laughs> so yeah. the more we can do when they're younger and identify these things early, the better they'll do as they're older. And we see a big, we see a big change in their periodontal status if they're well taken care of every year. Um, and so it's not trying to sell the process of dentistry. It's just how um, it's, it's the same in small animal, right? If you don't have your dog's teeth cleaned until they're 10 years old, it's probably going to need extractions when it has its teeth cleaned because they have periodontal disease. Mm -hmm. um, but for your case, you know what, I don't know where you live, but um, you know, there's, there's becoming more and more, the, the College of Dentistry didn't start certifying people in veterinary dentistry for equine until 2016. Actually, we tested our first people in 2015. So it hasn't been around that long of actually having veterinary dental specialists in horses, but we're getting better. I mean, we're testing a handful of people every year and hopefully that gets bigger and bigger, but uh, mm -hmm. 
it's there's definitely a need out there and I but there's also a lot of education that's happening and there are very good veterinarians out there that take an interest in dentistry that do a very good job um, that don't want to go through the residency program and I employ one of them he he does a great job he likes yeah. to float teeth and do diagnostics but he doesn't want to go through the grueling three-year process and that's totally fine too but he still does this kind of exam yeah. I mean, I just think there's a real disparity when I see, yeah. I now work with an equine dental specialist, but there's a disparity in, in the way oh, that yeah. exams are done for sure. Oh yeah. It's yeah. And it's well, and we're in a day and age now, unfortunately, that it's hard to know everything about all body systems. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's the other yeah. thing. Like, yeah. That was a great question, Denise. You clearly yeah. hit the, hit the jackpot with that one. <laughs> um, any any other questions from anybody? Where I don't want to impinge on Dr. Henry's time too much because he oh, Molly told me I had to be available all night long. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this this was great. Thank you so much. And then um, I will say the next month we'll have one, and March we'll have one, and April we'll have one. the The topics will be uh, hopefully colic, and then. Cushing's and equine metabolic syndrome to tie into the spring grass. So um, stay tuned, watch your scribe, watch the, the website and uh, sign up. And with Thanks that- Thanks so much for having me. This was fun. Thank you. Appreciate that was you. very, very good. All right. Have a great night. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah.